Hi. Welcome. Hello. Michael Vingord. Michael Vingord. Listen to that applause. That's fantastic. <laughs> Stephen Hall. Yeah, yeah, where are right, you? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Stephen Hill. Duan Chaudhary. <laughs> Not too far over here. Sorry. Oh, this one. Mm -hmm. I'll right next to me. And John Seidel. Welcome. <laughs> I hand over to you now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things we're going to do to start, uh, interestingly enough, I want everybody to, uh, can we put the question sheet up there right away? Because what I want, we discussed this, uh, everybody out here who's tweeting or doing anything, I want you to take the URL for the voting site plus the code and send it to everybody you know saying you're at this control system security conference and we would like a random question followed by the country that you're in. So we're going to get questions from here. Send everybody you know right now, Snapchat, whatever it is that's going to work, send that out to folks. We want to see this absolutely light up for this panel as it relates to ICS attack research. Is that cool? So just take a couple of minutes, fire it off because this thing is just going to light up with questions. And then we're going to take questions from you guys mm -hmm. and we're going to take questions from the world. We're going to see if that will work. All right. So we'll talk <laughs> until that comes in. The theme of this discussion, according to the almost last entry in the, uh, in the section, is research in ICS attacks. So there's a bunch of things that we've been talking about in the context of that statement, research in ICS attacks. And it can be looked at two ways. One is, is looking at the research as it relates to building and performing the attacks, and it also relates to the research in the attacks as well. We had this discussion, and I think that one of the more interesting things that needs to be vetted or talked about here is, is the approach, is the mechanisms that we're using to do useful research. Now, up to this point in time, we've concentrated a lot on looking at specific devices. And I think that the community of interest is actually getting a little tired of just device-specific security. Yes, there's hard-coded passwords in this PLC, or yes, we know how to exploit transitive trust across domains and things like this. When do we make the migration in attack research for control systems from the devices to the systems? Because when we start having the discussion about the research as it relates to the system itself, then we can start figuring out tactics and tactics are what's really important in both offensive and, of course, defensive when you figure out the tactics. So I'm going to start here with Stephen on the right. We've had the talk about ICS attack research, control system attack research as it relates to devices. How important is it that we begin to move beyond the device into the system, and do we think that's a difficult lift? <clears throat> Absolutely, it's a difficult lift. Um, I think it takes a little bit of researcher mindset change to look away from just individual vulnerabilities and issues within a single device and then move that and make it into a staging process that this one can go to this one, that this one can go to this one, and that this entire system may be affected versus just a backdoor password or something like that that may or may not have a bigger effect on the system. So we kind of want to start moving the research scope to the systemic relationships for the device as it relates to the system itself. And we, and we know that when we're talking about you know, system certification, you look at the ISA models and other certification, they're moving from levels of device certification to system-specific certification, and there's complexity with assigning higher levels of security to systems because they're harder to, to figure out. So over to you, Michael. Yeah. We're actually going to ask the question, now that we say that we need to move forward in the context of looking at systems, how do we do that to help us better understand tactics? Is it going to give us more insight to tactics? Can we use research to develop appropriate tactics to help feed our proactive capability for defending systems? Yeah, of course we can do that. And basically also one thing that's pretty interesting when you're looking into the system uh, aspect is that today a lot of vendors just came with a black box and put mm -hmm. it into a system. And even when you start uh, asking the vendor, of, okay, what's actually inside the box, it's, uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty 
it's, it's much harder than if we move away from the small devices thing, if it's just one big chunk that's been delivered with like data servers and web servers and a lot of different things, it's actually pretty, pretty hard to do that. And the only way we can do that is by working together in the community and actually starting to do some more research in this and forget about, yeah, hard-coded credentials, it's really a bad thing. Yep. But we need to move forward and also need to work together. And I, I think that's valid because we have, you know, both there's two folks up here that did some some honey honey pot work and, and one was specific to smaller specific systems and the devices itself that could be used to look at or collect intelligence about how people looked at certain devices that had single roles. Juan, you actually did one as it related to a system as itself. Obviously we need to move forward in this research space. From your experience from that honeypot project and your own personal experiences, why do we need to get from the device to the system? Because, I mean, we have instances where single device failure will cause bad things to happen. Systems in themselves push the complexity of solving the problem farther for the asset owner when you have a system which is comprised of many interdependent devices. Well, can you, is my mic on? All right. Well, you know, that's one of the challenges we all face in the community. When we see research coming up, it's always pertaining to one little a PLC or a one little RTU. But the reality is that all these industrial processes actually have interdependency with multiple devices. And you look at a substation, you'll find multiple RTUs there. You know, and we look at, they do have a domino effect that if I could trigger, knock off a couple RTUs, and that'll trigger a relay on a substation. Well, <laughs> what happens if I take a 230kV substation down? How does that affect other parts of the grid? So it becomes, you know, it becomes imperative that we just know microscope and just look everything from a microscope. We have to actually, you know, look at a binocular, look at how it affects the entire enterprise. And that's one of the key elements because if we just sit there focused on one thing, we forget about the rest. I mean, it just goes back. It's almost like understanding your supply chain within your own organization. If this goes out, how does it affect the rest? So uh, that's one of the key reasons we took this approach. And especially on the power grid, you can't just do one device. It has to be the whole thing, the, the, the entire package. Okay. Um, and I want to continue this with Jan. From the, from the perspective of looking at, I mean, again, we could talk about the physics of all of this, right? But we see this emergence of wanting to move into the systems. And I do actually want to go back to one of my earlier points and just move this forward because we could all agree that we have to move from to the device. But let's talk about let's talk about actual tactics. How does an understanding, better understanding of the control system as itself rather than a whole bunch of devices together, how does an understanding of the system help us create a better understanding of tactics? And do we need to advance research for actual tactics itself? Yes, I, I strongly believe we have to move uh, from individual spots to actual the tactics and the maneuvers. Um, I also think that uh, when you're thinking about the, all the moving parts in the system concept and not only in the devices, uh, you are able to, to have the bigger picture of something that you might have overlooked when you're looking only to the device. Uh, there's, we were talking about this research, mm -hmm. about some f uh, fellow colleagues, uh, Marina and Jason Larson, uh, that triggering a, a simple a DOS uh, in one of the components of the whole system could uh, cause a delay of a valve to respond to, a, to an actuator or a signal, and that could be uh, enormously disruptive. So uh, this is uh, not attacking a single device, but a class of attack, and it's one of the tactics being used in uh, this system view and not only device specific. So we, so we all agree that, can we have the house lights up a bit? I mean, these are, these are very bright, but I think it would be better if we can actually see some folks, that really doesn't make much of a difference too much, but oh it's right. actually better. Think we could sort of see. Everyone's sitting in the back. Everyone's sitting at the back. That's right. Maybe they've already left. <laughs> <laughs> They're just thinking. <laughs> Obviously, you can see. Thank you for sending the uh, the tweets and the blogs out for this. You can see that the questions and comments that are rolling in are absolutely 
have no value. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't put the country afterwards. Right, and, and also we are looking for attribution here. Nobody has bothered actually telling us what country they're coming from. We can guess. China. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, we could guess. Remember, we will ultimately be going, this will go to YouTube. Uh, I just don't even know what to make of this. Look at this. There's some great stuff. Why hasn't it been fixed? And there's something about who's wearing red. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. No, seriously, get ba getting back to this. Tactics use specific vulnerabilities, and usually tactics involve a collection of vulnerabilities, either some known, some zero day, uh, and things like this. Um, how are the tactics going to have a greater influence on proactive countermeasures. Now, this is the deal, though. It's like it's a game of cat and mouse. The, the proactive countermeasures that we actually create using tactics based on understanding what tactics the next generation of attackers could actually have. What have we learned in the past? Let me ask you. Let me ask you. What have we learned from tactical perspective? And again, I am trying to change the discussion into talking about attack research as it relates to tactics as opposed to specific vulnerabilities. And honeypots are still useful. We're, we want to get moved to the system because the system understanding from a control system perspective is important. That, that's what differs from the IT, looking at a system as interdependent and interoperable devices that one single device failing may not introduce catastrophic failure, but the combination and a, a flow of combinations or a detailed choreography of the combination, which could be tactics, would, right? So let me ask you this, looking at tactics specifically, why moving from vulnerabilities of individual assets into taking collections of vulnerabilities to create tactics using attack tree and methodology, where is that going to get us to in terms of creating actual functional proactive methods that the adversary is not going to pick up on and we're going to be able to put this in place and have some breathing room? Yeah, I actually I think that uh, Robert had uh, quite a few interesting notes in his presentation. It actually comes back to uh, some of the thing is that even back to the basic thing. If we don't baseline our system, if we don't know what's going on, we uh, really do have uh, a, a problem. Moving forward with that, it also like we can never be, it's just like a chess game. We would always be the one who have we, we, we would be behind. But the thing is also that the more you know and the more you're able to baseline and s do stuff like that, the faster you would be able to pick up. I, I think it's really a disgrace that uh, some of the reports, and um, they might be placed and a lot of other things, shows actually that how long people can be in inside a really critical uh, control system without actually the asset owner or the operators actually knowing that. That's definitely something we need to, to work on. Okay, and before, Duan, outside, we actually talked about the issue, but I asked the question, do emerging attacks take into consideration requirements to overcome our new fancy countermeasure? Let's have the discussion about the fact that not only do we need to move away from device-specific testing, because although interesting, it's not all the time. We, we're getting kind of old in it, uh, kind of getting, getting kind of tired of it. Um, what do we know what have we seen from current attacks and emerging attacks that clearly demonstrate that the tactics are beginning to understand what our countermeasures are? I mean, we're having great conversations about network security monitoring, which is viable. And it's not necessarily the tools, it's the people, so we can have the conversation about culture. But what are we seeing right now that relates to an obvious capability that people are overcoming our best stuff? All right. One of the things we have to put in consideration is let's look at the biggest high-profile attacks that are publicly known, Rasgas, Aramco, even Stuxnet. We have to realize that so, like one of the companies I mentioned is probably the biggest company in the world. It's just quasi, that's why it's not. Their cyber infrastructure is probably in a billion dollars. It's ridiculous. I mean, their cyber budget is probably the defense budget of some countries. How do they get hacked? You're dealing with nation states. You're dealing with folks that have intimate human intelligence on the ground. You know, th for operators on the ground, you could put up the biggest fort in the world around, have alligators going around. What happens if you have that insider threat or someone who didn't realize that they brought something nasty into the fort? This is the reality we have to, you know, we have to deal with. You know, one of the challenges is that we have a lot of 
theoretical folks talking about cybersecurity in the industrial control world. That becomes a challenge because folks who come from politicians, national security figureheads, and they're telling industry how to better secure their environment, yet some of these guys were responsible for some of the worst attacks while they're, you know, uh, creating policies or protecting the nation or the cyber assets. And on the, within, you know, when you talk within operators in the industry, there's a completely different perspective of what they see as threat, which I always find fascinating. And, you know, till today, you know, that's one of the three things I mentioned, these were all leveraged insider threat. You know, one thing, I'm not sure if uh, the book uh, uh, the, regarding Stuxnet, the lady who gave the uh, presentation yesterday, one of the things people, very few people realize is that the first submissions of Stuxnet, you will actually see the debug name of the user who submitted it. These two users, if you go into LinkedIn, you would find them. They had insiders to go out there, populate this program, pop it into and, and within the OT environment, and guess what? Within a, two, three months, they all flew out. One's working in Canada as a PLC engineer, the other one uh, somewhere in Europe. This is how they get in. I mean, if you have a motivated actor, nation state, human intelligence on the ground, they're going to get in. So, you know, one thing, let's look at the realistic reality how they get in and, you know, look at how we counter from there. Um, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, we do firsthand, uh, have firsthand experience going out and doing incident response for uh, industrial control system operators. And sometimes you'd be surprised how they get in. But at the end of the day, you know, certain conversations that go, whether it be network uh, service uh, monitoring, it still needs to happen. Sure. I mean, there's, it's one of those things where we take the best of IT, put it into OT. So we're, we're getting technical capabilities now to give us a better common operating picture of what's going on. So one of the questions that actually came up, are you ready? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> one of the questions that actually came up, would it be useful or even doable to create some sort of lexicon or database for measurement like CVE, not for vulnerabilities, but for tactics? Uh, well, test, uh, tactics change um, periodically. So I think it would be a little more difficult to make a system that would gauge the tactics. Uh, tactics ratings also depend also on potentially who it was and where it was going. So I think it would be a little harder to rate it, but uh, I mean, I'm sure there's people out here who can, who can figure some systems out. Um, and I think it'd have to be more specific to the systems uh, for ICS and other systems as well. It'd have to be subcategories. -category to, to rate that system. Okay, but I mean, uh, seriously, I mean, we think we've got ourselves convinced right now that we've got this kill chain figured out. Isn't everything that we actually see, either at a device or system level, in a step plugged into some point in that kill chain? Uh, so I, that don't, I would disagree that I think we have the kill chain figured out. Good. So, I agree. and that's kind of the point <laughs> of, a, it's, a, it's a long road to get there, mm -hmm. and I think we're moving in the right direction to figure some of that some of that out. Okay, so we've also got another question that just popped up that, that raises, that kind of turns the conversation sideways because maybe we're not taking into consideration the intelligence of the actual instrumentation. So Jan, if we're actually talking about instrumentation, should we be having the conversation about attacks of the future and attack research looking at instrumentation, being able to get right down to the instruments themselves? I, I think everything, not everything, but most should be covered from instrumentation up. Um, when we are talking about tactics, uh, we are talking about the combination of factors not that would overcome your security or the combination of tactics you use to protect your resources. But yeah, from an uh, instrumentation f point of view, the yeah, there should be specific for all the parts, specific researches in all those parts, not only in devices, not only on, on operating systems or black boxes. We, because uh, the spot that we, that we live open, it will become the next static. And of course, uh, with offensive research, uh, it's one of the ways of getting uh, the future attacks. Because 
future, you, you get current attacks with honeypots, but you get to the next generation ones trying to overcome your current limitations. You, you, you try the current attacks, you already have current defenses. So what's the next step? And when you figure out what's the next step, then you develop the next generation uh, security on top of that. All right, good. A question actually popped up, and maybe you guys can discuss it as we, as we change away. We're going back to the, the honeypot question, right? What, what is the difference going to be between deploying a honeypot? And it, it, is there a difference between deploying a honeypot and a random PLC? Why is the answer no? This is a good conversation. Why is the answer no? Is there, is there a difference? And I, I, I would tend to disagree that it is no all the time because a random device versus a set or series or um, a system of devices or a single device, which a single honeypot, which is comprised of system components, right? Is, is, is there a difference between a randomly deployed PLC and a, 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 a proper honeypot per se? I would say yes, there is a difference. Okay. Um, the reason why is as more and more uh, things become uh, and more and more attackers become more knowledgeable about these systems, they're going to start realizing what they're looking at is not an actual system um, because they got to a PLC and it has you know f uh, a random PLC stuck on the internet. It has only four IOs and they're not really anything. Um, and I think the, going back to our system talk, uh, attackers are learning the systems, they're learning how things should be built, how things would be comprised. Um, as Duan said the other day, there's no IP, it's all out there. People know how these things will work. They will learn more and more about how they work and get to have a better knowledge uh, stance and that these things will start sticking out like sore thumbs. So you need to take it to the next level okay. and keep adding on and making it look more and more realistic as possible. You can't have just it respond to the protocol with a, just a few commands. Right. Swamp, comment? You know, if we, if we take the same perspective and let's just look at the IT enterprise and, you know, with all the various honeypots out there, um, have we learned in the past couple of years? Well, not really. I mean, the uh, tactics of advanced threat actors are surpassing what, you know, we're standing up for defense. This is the big challenge we have on the ground. And, um, you know, let's, I mean, for anybody who's actual in, from, from the industry as an operator, I mean, there's certain elements that we know that would uh, raise alarm bells for what are, you know, for running an oil and gas refinery or in the uh, electrical sector that the moment, you know, we see a system and all of a sudden like, hey, I can have access to any relay and shut it down. That's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, all of a sudden uh, you, you start digging in deeper and you realize, hey, the project, you know, the project logic control, it's just, where's the other components of it? Or you start sniffing further down the network. So that's one of the challenges is that I think for a truly motivated entity to who, that wants to do sabotage on your environment, they know what they're going to do, be doing. Uh, but, you know, we have the other elements. We may have some kids that are you know, very curious and dumb and get a stumble to your honeypot, sure. like what we had, and they started yeah. to say, okay, let's shut down their 500 kV substation. What would happen? Mm -hmm. But I... My personal opinion, I think, if someone's really motivated to do true sabotage in your environment, they're going to have they're going to have the technical expertise to know if they're what they're looking at is to be is it true or not. Excellent, excellent. I do have another question for you in a second. Uh, some of the questions that you can actually see rolling in are sound and useful. I've been advised that the idea of inviting external commentary won't work because it's Europe, but yet we're still receiving comments. So we can clearly deduce that the nonsense we're seeing is not coming from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great. A good question that was posited was, we're looking at research right now, and we continue to say it's somewhere between 8 to 10 or 12 years ahead of what the vendors are doing. Right? A lot of the time, the vendors are responding to the research that's actually done, either reactively because it was posted through non-responsible disclosure, or they're rushing to be able to do it in a responsible manner because they've been working with various certs or the researchers themselves. 
how does that gap close? I mean, we're at 2015 going into 2016. How does this gap move? We know the vendors are still making some mistakes or not doing enough, or we tell them we're not doing enough, but at the same time, we're aware of the fact that many of the leading vendors have cybersecurity capability and some sort of leadership. I've had the discussion with vendor security leadership, and they get it. They get it, the representation that the vendors bring to the table, they clearly understand the problems. They've got some smart people there, and yet we still find this. How do we close the gap when we seem to be having all of the right parts in the right place? I think it's uh, a, a cultural gap in what refers to uh, engineers and infosec professionals. <coughs> and the gap is created uh, when one company is specializing in doing automation equipment and has no previous background of trying to do security. And the security products are doing security for years but have no previous knowledge of doing security for SCADA. Mm -hmm. um, you want to add something? No, I'm, uh, I'm agreeing uh, with you. I'm just agreeing yeah. with you, but I'm also watching some of these questions. So, so this happens vendor side, this happens in the plants, like the both teams are always fighting together because one wants to implement security, the other wants to, to have the 100% uh, uptime. And uh, the, the guys from uh, the ICS manufacturers, they're making some good progresses on, on security, but as they lack, I don't know, a bigger research on security team, they, their countermeasures are not very efficient and people still try to implement IT security software to try to protect the, the, the border because um, there are more mature solutions and it's good to see that those IT vendors are now specializing mm -hmm. in, 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 in adding uh, SCADA ICS protocols to their products and starting to look for this, this matter more Can closely. More? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we had this debate, not debate, I mean, we had this, this same exact issue, you know, when working at a utility was, here we are, we have the smart grid now. We're putting in all these smart devices that have Apache running on them, all sorts of, you know, galore that introduces vulnerabilities. And when you talk to some of the major vendors of the world, uh, you know, that support the, uh, not only uh, the power, but oil and gas, whatever, because... And, you, you know, and we were asking, can you put cybersecurity functions in there? The f that was the first mistake. We never defined it for them. Yeah. So what we did was, what we were doing, we're, we were actually putting cybersecurity requirements in the RFP. Have to have radius. If you have encryption, it has to be XYZ algorithm. We're not taking che cheap algorithm. You know, if, if we want LDAP, we want LDAP support. Anything you would expect to find in the IT world, we were expecting to be put within an OT device. And it was pain. We sometimes, you know, you would kick back the RFP five times until finally they took it serious. We're like, you know what? I mean, here's a question. Your industry, you're paying the vendors to come to you. You have the decision power making. I mean, a lot of times, I think we as industry need to flex our muscle. If they're not willing to cooperate, well, guess what? There's another vendor out there somewhere. And that's what ended up happening. I mean, and think about it. If you're vendor X and I incorporate cybersecurity controls into my, you know, my, this X box, I get to market to all my uh, potential marketplace and tell my competitions. The competition sucks. They don't secure the infrastructure. So believe it or not, as industry, you have way more flexibility and capability to ensure cybersecurity controls are built into your devices. Take full advantage. You're the ones that are calling, cutting off the million euro, million dollar checks, take full advantage of that. If they don't want to play by your rules, find somebody else. If I could uh, add something more. Also one thing that I think that's really important when you're sitting on the client side is I totally agree that you need to do the, the requirements, but you also need to be really, really specific. Um, in another role I had uh, previously, I was uh, one time asked by a client, does your product support ISO 700 blah, blah, blah? Just like, this is just too vague. And then when you start telling the guy a bit and said, why do you require that? Oh, I looked up on the internet that this should be something, something I should ask my vendor about. 
It's just like, hey, come on, what, what do you seriously want? All right, you want to be sure that it's not hard-coded credential. All right, in that case, put it in. If you need to put some requirements, also make it doable for the vendor as such, actually to be able to comply with it. And yes, you know, there would be a lot of bouncing, and it also take a bit of time for you as a customer, as a client, actually to find the bearings, but it, believe me, it's, it's well worth the effort. And there are bump in the wire, you know, even if, if it's not available. I mean, we come in the reality, there's that one manufacturer, one vendor, you have no, they have no competition. There's plenty of vendors out there that do bump in the wire solution, where you could stick a little device and it'll be, be the firewall, IDS, you know, it'll do DMP3, Modbus, 68150, you name it, and it'll sit there as a security gateway to this unsecured device. So sometimes maybe, you know, part of the RFP process, that's the reality, make sure that you incorporate, you must, if you can't do it, then find mm -hmm. a vendor or put it at a product that will make sure fulfills our cybersecurity requirements. A absolutely, I mean, I mean, the, the asset owners themselves for coming on 10 years now have been empowered with a variety of different procurement language guidance documentation all around the world, all around the world, and that can be used. Mm -hmm. The thing is though, as I understand it, is that the vendors have access to that information as well and also recognize that the decision process by the buyers, the asset owners, is gonna be based on security. So they are now looking at those requirements in their, the specifications of the emerging technology. Uh, I do think we need to take a step back and look at what the vendors are doing in terms of the stuff that's coming out now because I think the path forward for the last five or six years has been much better. We find at the device level vulnerabilities for stuff that has been out there for a long time or parts of code that have been their flagship code that is you know, sometimes harder to fix. So I think there is a dual responsibility that we have to first of all recognize that the vendors, at least, and this is my experience, the vendors are beginning to do a better job. They are paying the money to get the talent on staff to be able to look at their stuff. They are developing security development life cycles in the product, and there is a notable reduction in the number of vulnerabilities that are actually coming out. There's some older stuff that even they don't know about. That being said, the asset owners need to be empowered to say, I'm gonna put this into the procurement specs and make sure that during FAT and even SAT, we're checking off the boxes. So. Um, Attribution, people keep asking about attribution. I'm curious as to why, and you, maybe you can help me understand this, Stephen. Um, why do people care about attribution, where it actually came from? I mean, I, I don't think, I think it's important. I think it's interesting to where it's come from. Does it relate to tactics? Why do people want to know where stuff is coming from? I think a lot of the attribution comes to potentially uh, due to the issue uh, that people want to know why not just how, they wanna know why they were attacked. Okay. Um, it comes down to also that you want to be able to stop it. So if it's somewhere specific, that's a known, or becoming a known tar, uh, tar uh, attacker, that you can then work on what their tools, techniques, uh, and procedures are. Uh, and then from there, you could come up with a better understanding of how and why they're attacking and better ways to prevent them. Now, it's a double-edged sword because the more you know about them, the more they are going to change what they're doing and elevate and keep going sometimes. Sometimes so they just maintain the same because they don't care. So you guys can jump in here. So the attribution aspect, is, it could be driven by interest and curiosity, I, yeah. right? Usually it gets you source information. I mean, the IP addressing is source information that needs to be blocked for variable uh, indicators of compromise, right? Yeah. In North America, we have Sticks Taxi, the information sharing exchanges, which Correct. becomes very, very important for attribution because it allows us to develop, you know, the 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 the, the TTP, the adversary, yeah. right? But I mean, are are we missing something in terms of attribution? Are we looking for attribution for the wrong reason, guys? Are we looking because we think it's just cool and we want to know that country X or country Y or I, country Z is coming yeah. after us? Well. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. is unique that it's, it's private. A lot of the, you know, uh, you, a lot of the industrial operations that you may find public in certain nations. So, but if we take a step now, let's go into the Middle East, where I mean, it's the hotbed. I mean, there's actual information warfare going on there. It's a political reason why you want attribution. I mean, this is the key element. If, I mean, it's we live in a culture that's it's a culture for eye for an eye. So all of a sudden, if a substation in Tehran gets, you know, gets owned, you have to pay back. You have to respond in some manner. So 
this is one of the key elements for, you know, I mean, it's part, it's part of the geopolitical narrative now that uh, attribution can result in penalties. We've seen, think about the U.S. government putting san poten uh, potential sanction on China for cyber espionage. We've seen arrest warrants go out. I mean, we've seen the, two weeks ago, a hacker was droned in Iraq or Syria. This is the reality. I mean, attribution has actually become penalized. We'll sanction you to all we will drop a Hellfire missile on you. I mean, this is the reality. I mean, why attribution is becoming such a key element. Now, to a corporation, I've been in places like, we don't care. We just want it off our network. I've heard that plenty of times. But if you're a gas, you know, if you're, a if you're a gas company that's owned by the state, trust me, they want it. that information goes straight out to the Ministry of Defense or the Ministry of Intelligence, and they take, and they, after that, they do their work. So at certain levels, if I read into this, at certain levels, you think attribution becomes important because it allows the defending entity to have a better insight into tactic. Oh, yeah, and what they want. I mean, that's yeah. the, if it's, if it's espionage, you know, at least they can look at, figure out, okay, uh, if someone's stealing um, uh, oil, cons oil production data in a Middle East country, and they can figure out, well, who would be interested in this? So you can start, you know, narrowing down, like, okay, why would this actor? Sometimes friendly actors. I mean, people for forget, like in the States, uh, in the United States, they put the top three uh, espionage actors out there. It's uh, Russia, China, and Israel's there. And that's considered a friendly country. Mm -hmm. So there's no game in the world of espionage. Uh, no friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone's willing to steal from everybody. Uh, at the end of the day, it's up to the, uh, you know, whoever's holding that data, analyzing what mm -hmm. they want to do with it. But... I think in parts of the Middle East where it's just geopolitical driven. I mean, okay. when they figure out who it is, they want to take action. So, so that leads me to start thinking, we understand that this is an area of research that could be improved upon, being able to look at tactics. And someone raised the point is, is in, the, in the questions, among all the fantastic commentary we're seeing, there are some gold nuggets in there. One of them said, is part of the problem the absence of realistic subject matter expertise that can look at the problem? I mean, I know that this community of interest is actually starving for more talent who actually knows the science about the control system cybersecurity issue. So, Jan, if we understand that we need all this research to keep up with the bad guys, we have all this research that could help empower vendors to do a better job, how are we going to solve the problem associated with populating our community of interest with people who are real subject matter experts in cybersecurity, or is it a waiting game? You can't really make this. We are trying to introduce cybersecurity culture into the engineering curriculum at the university, but it's not coming fast enough. You yeah. need the real world experience, right? Especially for some of the older systems. You take great engineers that are coming out nowadays, they can't actually interface with an RT or a PLC unless there's an embedded web server, and they have no idea the concept of a fault table. Yeah. They can't. I can't talk to that device or program unless I've, I've got a web server, right? Mm -hmm. We're starving for the talent. How do we fix that? Yeah, I think this is a, a very serious problem that the access to the information and the equipment to, to try it on and to research on is still uh, uh, not as easy in the, in the other parts of the world that as is and the developed countries. And I think there's this double-edged sword that we need to lower the bar that is needed for people to step in and to start getting interested in that. And of course, by doing that, we are also feeding the bad guys with, uh, with the information, the, the knowledge. But yeah, well, we can't do this of holding the things from the bad guys. We are also holding things from the good guys and we are creating uh, uh, market with less professionals or with less skilled professionals than we could be if the information that we need to work on it uh, was more readily available, if the equipments were more readily available, uh, if universities had uh, not only the automation lab but uh, a branch of the course that goes for security from the ground up not going to make specialization courses after you graduate. You right. start graduating in parallel from your automation process okay. or your security uh, class. 
Is, it, is this correct from a European perspective yeah. as well, or, or is there differences? And you guys can actually huh. think about it, because I want to ask from a North American perspective, mm. because sometimes these opinions mm. differ. We have a global requirement to solve this problem in research, which is going to require very clever, smarter mm. people, because it's not like 15 years ago when the landscape of all this great stuff to do. I mean, now kind of some of that stuff is done. We need newer stuff. Is this issue the same from a European perspective, and is it solved differently? The problem is, uh, of course, it's, as you mentioned, it's a global problem. I also think it's pretty much as uh, the discussion we had uh, regarding uh, cryptography for the last decade. It's just like, oh, if you have nothing to hide, you don't need to be able to encrypt. Hey, let's face it, the bad guys are using regardless of it's against the law or what. So I also think we should take the opportunity to, to let people get into and start learning this thing, give them as many opportunities as possible. One thing that I know in, in some countries is that the, the vendor is actually actively working with people from university because, first of all, it's a really, really easy and nice way to make people learn about their system and when they're educated, they come out and say, hey, by the way, when the X, Y, Z is something I know about. And secondly, the bad guys is going to have their hands on the system anyway. In some way or other, if they have enough resources, if they have enough people, eventually they're going to have that knowledge. So oh, I agree. I, I, don't, I don't think that education, it, practical education from the classroom is ever going to trump the experience you get from being in the plant. Okay. When you be, you know, you're actually hands on the EMS, when you're in the field, you're actually okay. trying to be in a substation. Mm -hmm. From a North American perspective, I, is, is this right? Are we, you know, North America tends to have the, the largest pool of training and education centers specific for ICS. We're seeing a global uptick in people wanting to go to these courses because they are advised this is what the first step is going to be. And they're also, and it's just cool. And people want to go and try cool because everybody's, everybody's doing it these yeah. days kind of thing, right? Is, it, is this the right approach? Are we ever going to figure out, are we ever going to be able to create a situation where the future state SMEs are going to be immediately thrust into real world events that is going to get them that education. Yeah, I think uh, it's kind of, <clears throat> we're building up to it. Conferences like this yep. with the Geek Lounge and all the lab and all the equipment that's down there. I mean, it's cool for my experience uh, because most of the equipment I've, I've seen down there, but there's a few things I've never played with. So when I was down there earlier today, I got to play with it, you know, give it a good shake, see how this equipment handles versus this equipment. I think it's a good experience for people, and it's kind of the same thing with classes, is it gets that person who needs to do these assessments and look at industrial control systems to understand the implications of how to handle the devices, how to do the assessments, how to make, and look for real problems versus just running an SS report, spitting it out. But here's real recommendations about how to fix these problems. Because if we just run Nessus reports and say you need to patch a bunch of times, we're gonna not solve the problem and we're gonna have the same issues we're having now. And, the, and I think a lot of it, the problem is people hold on to these things like their secret sauce. Yeah. And yeah. we need to share the knowledge so we fix the problems um, that it's not really that hard to do an assessment. And they're actually fairly easy to fix uh, and secure these networks if you're just being smart about it. Um, one of my big gripes is I honestly don't think a next-gen firewall allowing Modbus through only for reads is still a good idea. Yes, they can prevent writes. In theory, there may not be any vulnerabilities on that firewall, but attackers are still going to be trying and trying and trying and trying to find that avenue to get to what they want. So we need to make it as hard as possible to keep going. And if you can, and instead of trying to block it, you can do more, uh, where's Chris? NSM, other things like that, do more monitoring, teach defenders how to handle these networks and the devices. And I mean, the only way you can do it is educate. Right. I got, and, and I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Something I want to I There was actually research done on this in terms of do we have enough cybersecurity talent just in America alone? And the answer was absolutely not. The demand for cybersecurity. This cyber, is just general talent. General, general, general cybersecurity general cyber talent. And 
this is becoming an epidemic. I mean, the demand for cyber solutions for whether it be small business, large enterprise, OT environment is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. As more high profile attacks occur, the more demand for cybersecurity in, uh, increases. Now, if we push this to our world and the OT world with an industry, there's, that's even a bigger challenge. To do security properly, in my personal opinion, in the OT world, you need to know the science of what you're securing. You need to know the basics of running a power plant or substation or oil and gas refinery. You need to know how pump jacks operate and how pressure, op you know, how it's affected by pressure. Because when you're trying to protect these assets, you got to figure out which is the most critical asset that could cause the most disruption. A typical cybersecurity guy is not going to know that. that yeah, but I, I'd like to pinch in that if you ask the guys from automation which is more critical, instead of pointing out which a system could explode and kill a million people, they would say the system that if it stops, they lose like $4 million. Well, either way, I mean, it could be mm. safety or it could be financial. Yeah. I mean, uh, I stated before, the top biggest companies in the world is all from ICS. This is how they make the profit margin. And it did. This is a profit center. So within industry, that's, it's a big challenge. The other thing is it's the siphoning of good talent. Yeah. I mean, I, you hear this all the time. You'll meet somebody from... You know, the ICS cert, and he disappears um, a year later. What happened? Well, I just doubled my salary going out here. Mm -hmm. So if you're a utility operator and you're paying, you know, utility salary, how are you going to get the best cyber talent or how are you going to make them stay while you have some big consultant saying, hey, I'll double or triple your money? Um, it, it's one of those internal discussions, I think, where you may have to pay that cybersecurity guy Maybe an executive salary. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. challenge. Well, I, I mean, I think that that's a really interesting discussion. One of the observables that I made on this, and, and I, I think you guys will share it with me. If you haven't noticed, and when we're talking about progress and success and the learning curve going up, this is a dedicated industrial control system security conference that has no courses, content, instruction, or discussion or themes about SCADA 101. Everybody here understands the problem and does not need an introduction or refamiliarization with the fundamental components of control system operations, devices, the difference between SCADA and DCS, and the difference between an RTU and a PLC. I think that says something, that we can actually have a conference of this size and magnitude, bring in more than 20 countries, and actually not have to spend the cycles on the, on the historical fundamentals that take away. I think we have seen progress with that. So as we start to wind down before to the end of this, one of the themes that are coming up again and again is, again, back to, to IoT. Um, and I think it's interesting. People would also like to know, do you have a commentary about what can next-gen IoT learn from the successes and the mistakes from what's being done in the ICS world? I mean, I think there are enough parallels and similarities in that. I mean, just off the top of your head, are there some items? Is there uh, successes and mistakes that IoT is going to be able to take away from what we've been able to do in the past 15, 20 years? Uh, I honestly believe IoT will probably surpass um, ICS in the ability to fix these problems because once you affect, uh, more people understand what their toaster does mm -hmm. that may be connected to the internet than, um, you know, a temperature probe sure. in, in, a, in, a, in a, say, a fossil plant or something like that. So I think it'll get more attention, it'll be fixed sooner, it'll be easier to fix because they're cheaper devices to replace. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be like, you know, it used to be your phones lasted longer than they, you, you have now because, you know, the people stopped supporting it, so you want the new features, the new upgrades, and I think that's the way they're going to start pushing that. So. I don't think there's going to be a lot of parallels because I think they're going to surpass ICS. But you think, but you think the sense. personal people will say, I don't really care about critical infrastructure, but I do care about my I, own I critical infrastructure, I don't which is my fridge and my toaster. I don't think it's a care. I think it's a understanding. It's not even to the point where we need to educate the, the world about how all this stuff works. It's just it's personal to them. 
they see the toaster, they know what the toaster does. So do you think that that is in itself going to be able to drive the vendors to address the problems better, faster, and yeah, stronger? Yeah, because, because there'll be a bigger marketplace. Right. If, if you're a toaster vendor and you let your vulnerable toaster hang out there, nobody's going to buy the vulnerable toaster. But as a vulnerable uh, ICS device, it's already deployed. It'll be there for 15 years. For 15 years, and people are going to get a new fridge every two years. Yeah, you uh, just make them die faster. <laughs> <laughs> right, Jan? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, you also have to say you set the success and failures for next generation items. Well, so first of all, you have to define what was the success and what was the failure. And again, I think it would be a mistake just to take everything from IT and just, you know, little take it like one to one into ICS gator systems. Um, so I think it's really a problem, just as Stephen mentioned that. It, if if it doesn't make something that's concerning people, then it's really, really not going to. Um, newsletters, when you just said, oh, the newspapers, when you just said, oh, uh, X, Y, Z can take over the power grid in country Y or something like, it might get, in, get some attention, but it really don't get any traction of that. Right. Nope. The uh, IoT, especially on the consumer, where I think there's way more legislation, mm -hmm. more regulation. So, if there's one thing a company will react to immediately after they get hacked, if it's something pertaining to them, my credit card, my personal identification, uh, especially when it's consumer grade devices that are gonna be IOT, uh, th the amount of effort to put cyber on that, like in the, in the States, we, you know, I'm, probably all over, you see the home automation kits now. And one of the things you'll constantly see is their updates. Oh, we updated this, you know, this patch to deal with this encryption issue with, or this vulnerability. And you can see there's, especially when it deals with consumer and their personal belongings, there's much more of a effort um, to secure it because bad thing, it's hard to sell to consumers, but when they buy, it's great money. But if you mess up once, your reputation's done. John, close this out with your comments on, on what mistake have we made in ICS security? Maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it. If, if you were starting out in IoT security and, and be able to advise folks, be cautious of these things because I've seen it before in integrated information systems that result in some sort of kinetic real world thing that happens. What would you, what would you tell them? What would, you, what would be your well, guidance? There's this phrase that I like it very much that is uh, the people that doesn't understand its history, it's doomed it to repeat it. So uh, this is what happened with SCADA and it's happening again with IoT. Yep. Uh, they're going to the cybers and they're not looking wh what, what happened before in the generation that came before. So uh, in my point of view, when uh, uh, ICS started becoming cyberized, uh, instead of looking which challenges we're gonna encounter when we start to adding cyber bits to this. Right. So let's look to the uh, IT problems mm -hmm. and let's at least address these problems, which doesn't. And here comes IoT doing this again. Instead of looking back to the problems in IT and the problems in the ICS, sure. let's just plug in an Ethernet port here in this product and let's monitor your baby from <laughs> my phone. So uh, they're repeating the same story yep. and uh, suddenly something is gonna come after IoT which did not research the, the story, the history in the past and it will be repeating over and over. Excellent. Excellent. We've covered an awful lot of ground. We, ha we are four seconds over right now. <laughs> uh, so we're going to close it. I want to thank the panel very much. We've discussed some great things. Uh, we're going to be around for a little bit because we hope we kicked over some anthills for you guys to be thinking about to the panel talking about ICS attack research. Thanks very much. <laughs>